This video will cover ecosystems and energy transfer in ecosystems through the food web. First, let's review some important vocabulary about the levels of ecological organization. If you start with an organism, one single individual organism, the next level up is a population, which is all of the organisms of a given species living in an area. Next, you get to community. That is all of the living things completely living in an area. So not only all of the turtles living in a pond, but also all of the fish and all of the birds and all of the aquatic insects and plants that live in that pond. Once you get up to ecosystem, you're dealing with the living things, the biotic factors, and the non-living things, the abiotic factors. So you not only have all of the turtles and the fish and the birds that are living in a pond, but also the interaction of the water, the sunlight, the temperature, all of those abiotic factors that play in as well. So an ecosystem is all of the organisms in a community plus the abiotic factors that interact with them. Ecosystems are self-sustaining, like this terrarium. They do need some things, though, in order to sustain themselves. First, they need to be able to capture energy and transfer it through the ecosystem, from the plants to the organisms, etc. Also, as we talked about yesterday, the nutrients in this ecosystem need to be able to cycle. The carbon, the nitrogen, the water, all needs to be reused over and over again. So the nutrients in an ecosystem cycle. Matter can neither be created nor destroyed, so it must be reused throughout the ecosystem. Energy, on the other hand, flows an ecosystem. It enters via the sun and goes through a food chain, well, as we will talk about in a second. So when energy enters an ecosystem, it enters at the level of the producers, which are organisms that can produce their own food. This includes plants, protists, bacteria, anything that can photosynthesize and make its own food. Next, we have the primary consumers, or herbivores, that eat the plants. At each level, you'll notice that this squiggly red line is indicating a loss of energy. That is because every time that energy moves up a food web, there is a little bit that is lost. Actually, there's a lot that's lost. We'll talk about that in just a second. So next, the secondary consumers, or the carnivores, eat the primary consumers, the herbivores, and they get energy from them. So as you can see, the energy flows through from the producers and up the food chain. So food chains are made up of multiple different trophic levels, or feeding levels. It starts with energy from the sun, which is then captured by the plants. Plants and producers are usually the first level of all food chains. The food chain can only go up four or five levels because there's an inefficient energy transfer. So it goes from the producers to the primary consumers, like herbivores, secondary consumers, or carnivores, and then it can sometimes go up to tertiary consumers, which are top carnivores. But as you can see, the food chain is limited. It can't keep going because it runs out of energy eventually. All of these things recycle down through the decomposers. So decomposers like fungus and bacteria actually break down organisms after they die and recycle those nutrients back into the system. Producers are also called autotrophs because they make their own food. Consumers are also called heterotrophs because they need to get their energy from other living organisms. Let's talk a little bit more about this loss of energy that occurs between each level of the food chain. Remember that all energy comes from the sun. A plant would use that sunlight to go through photosynthesis and make food for, for instance, a beetle. That beetle then has to do the stuff that it normally does in life. It reproduces, it creates waste, it 
has metabolism so it can move around and fly. All of that stuff that happens, about 90% of the energy that it gets from its food goes into the cost of daily living. And that is the part that's lost every single time that you go up the food chain. The only part that's available for the next level of the food chain is the energy that was put into growth, the actual growth of the body of the organism. So that's about 10% of the energy. That is the energy that moves on to the next level of the food chain. So as you can see, this is a very inefficient system in terms of transfer of energy. Most of the energy is lost as you go up each level of the food chain. So this creates what we call an ecological pyramid or an energy pyramid. If you start off at the bottom with one million joules of sunlight, every time you go up the pyramid, you're going to be able to feed fewer and fewer animals each time because the energy is going to get diminished. So if the sun, for instance, is supporting one billion plants, the energy in the next level can only support 100,000 insects, which then can only support 100 carnivores or omnivores. And that, in turn, can only support one tertiary consumer or top carnivore. So as you see, each level, since there's less energy available, it can support fewer and fewer animals. This leads to what we call a pyramid of biomass. That's why there are a lot more producers when you look around outside than there are top carnivores, like wolves, snakes, hawks. Those are the things that are usually smaller populations, need a much larger area to support themselves because they need to be able to hunt and find a lot more prey items to support themselves. It's very interesting to look at human interaction with the food chain. As you know, most humans are omnivores. We eat both plants and meat. But there are some who choose to be vegetarians. So let's think about how much energy does it actually take to feed a human? Well, if the human is a meat eater, it takes more energy to feed that human because there's less energy available at the level at which it, the human is eating. If the human is a vegetarian, they're eating lower on the food chain. It takes less energy to feed that human. Now, food chains make the whole thing a little bit more simple than it actually is. Really, you have food webs, which are lots of food chains that are linked together. So many species fit into more than one location in a food chain. They can eat more than one food item. They get eaten by more than one predator. So because of that, you get a more complex food web. So let's think about bears. Bears are omnivores. So when they're eating berries, they're acting as primary consumers. When they find a mouse to eat, then they're acting as secondary consumers. So they can feed at multiple levels of the food web at once. Humans are another example because, as I said, we are omnivores. So we can feed at multiple different levels. This just shows you the complex interactions that can happen in an ecosystem and also why conserving biodiversity is so important. Any one of these links of the food web could be very important in terms of maintaining a stable ecosystem. If a certain population starts to go down or starts to increase, it's going to affect the rest of the food web in turn.